My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of atrial fibrillation, AFib. And this video is entitled Rate versus Rhythm. Okay, let's get started. As far as I'm concerned, there are only two important dimensions to life. The first is length of life. The second is quality of life. And it is really important not to mistake these two as being synonymous. Just because we may have a great quality of life does not automatically mean that we will live till we are 100 years old. And just because we have a poor quality of life does not mean that our death is round the corner. I'll give you an example of this. People with bad migraines may have a terrible quality of life, but they have a normal life expectancy. And people with a brain tumour may not necessarily have any symptoms at all, but their prognosis may be very limited indeed. And therefore, whenever we are faced with a medical condition, it is always good to ask, one, how will this condition affect my length of life and what measures can help improve my length of life? And two, how does this condition impact on my quality of life and what measures can improve my quality of life? So today I wanted to talk to you about atrial fibrillation with this in mind. Atrial fibrillation is a disorder both of heart rhythm and heart rate. And it is a condition that can adversely affect both quality of life and length of life. In terms of quality of life, AF may cause symptoms just because the heart beats irregularly, or it may cause symptoms because the heart beats irregularly and fast, right? So it's a, a rhythm problem, but it can also be a rate problem in addition to a rhythm problem. So some people uh, don't like it just because they go into an irregular rhythm, but more people don't like it because they go irregular and they go fast. And therefore, there are two strategies in this setting to try and improve symptoms in patients with AF. The first is a rate control strategy, which means that you simply try and stop the heart from racing excessively using medications such as beta blockers, digoxin, calcium blockers, or even using a technique called pace and ablate. In this strategy, you accept the irregularity all you're trying to do is control the heart rate and stop the heart racing. The second strategy is a rhythm control strategy where you try and get the patient back into a normal rhythm. Okay, and you can do so by medications such as flecainide, amiodrone, or a cardioversion, which is a shock treatment um, to the heart, or an AF ablation. The automatic assumption at first glance would be that if you can get rid of the AF, then surely that would be better in the long run compared to leaving the patient in AF, as being in AF could put more strain on the heart, etc. However, that is an assumption. What we need to do is see what research tells us. What do the data show? Which strategy is better for our long-term outcome or prognosis? Um, and the question that we're going to try and address is exactly this. Which strategy, rate control versus rhythm control, is better for prognosis, okay, for what happens to us in the future. Um, is it indeed better for us in the long run to be out of AF completely, or is it better for us not to try and be out of AF, but just to accept the AF and control the heart rate, which is generally a little bit easier to do with medications. Well, there are three important studies that I wanted to talk about which have tried to address this question. Some of these are a little bit old and therefore may not necessarily apply to current practice, but I'll go through them. The first study was a study called AFIRM, A-F-F-I-R-M. In AFIRM, 4,060 patients with recurrent AF were divided into two groups. The first group was a rate control arm, where patients were allowed to remain in AF, but they simply controlled the heart rate of the AF. The second group was a rhythm control arm, where patients were given medications, anti-dysrhythmic medications, to try and keep them in a normal rhythm. It's worth noting that this trial predated AF ablation, so really we were comparing medications um, to control the rate and medications to control the rhythm largely, or cardioversion, etc. But AF ablation wasn't happening when the study was done. Um, and so we cannot use this trial to guide us regarding whether AF ablation is helpful. Nevertheless, it's worth knowing that at the end of three and a half years, there was perhaps a slight decrease in all-cause mortality in the rate control arm 
there was no difference in the two groups with regards to cardiac death, arrhythmic death, or deaths due to strokes or brain bleeds. There was also no difference in global function status, and there was a much lower number of patients requiring hospitalization in the rate control arm. So in this particular trial, it seemed that there was no difference in terms of outcome between a rate control strategy and a rhythm control strategy. In fact, the people who had the rate control strategy did a little bit better. Why could this be? It may be that the medications that were being used to control the rhythm, anti-dysrhythmic medications, uh, had more side effects, and that may have been responsible for the slightly higher trend towards increased mortality in the rhythm control arm. The second study was uh, a study called RACE, uh, R-A-C-E. In this study, they looked at 522 patients, again with AF or atrial flutter of less than one year duration, and again compared a rate control arm with a rhythm control strategy. And again, the investigators found similar results to affirm there was no difference between the two strategies in terms of cardiovascular mortality between the groups, and there was actually a trend to a higher incidence of non-fatal complications such as heart failure, blood clots, adverse drug reactions, need for a permanent pacemaker in the rhythm control arm. Again, race predated AF ablation. And therefore, the conclusion was that ideally, if you're trying to use a rhythm control strategy, maybe a better way to do it would be one which does not require the long-term use of anti-dysrhythmic agents because it seemed that perhaps patients in the rhythm control strategy tended to do worse, maybe because of the anti-dysrhythmic agents. Now we have ablation, catheter ablation, which allows you to try and go back into a normal rhythm without having to use anti-dysrhythmic medications in the long run. And this has now become a very interesting question as to whether if you compare a rate control strategy versus a rhythm control strategy, and in the rhythm control strategy you use ablation, what is the difference in outcome? Now, would we see different results? So a more recent trial has looked at this question. And basically in this trial, they again enrolled people who were having a rhythm control strategy, but in the rhythm control strategy, patients also had ablation. Some patients also had an ablation uh, compared to a rate control strategy. This study was called the EAST AFNET4 study. In this trial, 2,789 patients who had been diagnosed with AF within a year and who were deemed as high-risk patients, patients who were older, patients who had previous strokes, patients who had diabetes, high blood pressure, heart failure, kidney disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, were either assigned to a rhythm control arm, medications, ablation, versus a rate control arm. And after five years or so, the trial was actually stopped early because the death from cardiovascular causes and even strokes was seen less frequently in the rhythm control arm. Conversely, side effects from medications, etc., were also more common in the rhythm control arm. So this was an interesting study because it showed us something different. It showed us that actually in a group of patients, if you can control the rhythm, they may do better. But that is a very select group of patients, patients who have had AF for less than a year and patients who are generally considered high risk. So this was at odds with the previous studies, but the interesting thing about this study was that some patients had had an ablation. So it's all a little bit confusing, but what does this all tell us? Well, it tells us that if you're asymptomatic and your quality of life is good, then at present there is no really strong evidence to suggest that being back in sinus rhythm is definitely, definitively going to be better for your future prognosis, such as preventing strokes, etc. And therefore, a rate control strategy is very acceptable because taking anti-dysrhythmic medications to try and go back into a normal rhythm can cause harm. Um, and even if you had an ablation, that can be associated with complications. So in general, if you're completely asymptomatic, there is no real need based on current data to want to go back into a normal rhythm uh, in the long run via taking anti-dysrhythmic medications or even an ablation.
On the other hand, if you are symptomatic and your quality of life is being affected by AF, and especially if you're high risk and have had the AF for less than one year, then a rhythm control strategy may be better, slightly better for your overall prognosis. The most important points to note are that neither strategy should be considered as an alternative to taking anticoagulants. The single intervention that will improve overall prognosis in AF in patients who are older and patients who have comorbidities is long-term anticoagulation, and patients should take an anticoagulant regardless of what strategy they choose. The other thing to say is, whilst we have data, you know, um, sort of medium-term data up to five years, etc., we don't have long-term data. So we don't know what happens in 15, 20 years if you have an ablation compared to if you're left in AF. Um, the, the first ablation was in 1999, so we're only 21 years away from the first ablation ever. So this data will take time to accrue, and we will at that point know whether the consequences of it, having something like an AF ablation are um, beneficial in the long run or in some way are associated with some kind of harm. So all very difficult at the moment, but in general I would say that if you are considering rhythm control strategies, that should be based around how symptomatic you are, not uh, really based around whether you're um, just an AF without symptoms. So I hope you found this useful. I'm currently, as you can see, in a hotel room. I am, um, and I think I should name and shame this hotel. This hotel is called the Courtyard, and uh, it's uh, by Marriott, and it is located at um, located in London City. This is part of a quarantine package. So when you come back from a a red zone country they bundle you into a bus with all other people who come from a red zone country there's no real regard for social distancing etc everyone is just shoved in a bus and they're sent to these hotels uh, the hotels charge 175 pounds a night and uh, i'll share some of the food that they uh, serve here which is absolutely scandalous and disgraceful so um if you want to do anything for me, please um, tweet uh, about how disgraceful the food is at the Courtyard Hotel by Marriott. Uh, and uh, I think it is important that people realize that this is absolutely scandalous where people are being charged this amount of money and being given so little. Anyway, thank you so much. This is my rant over for the day and uh, I wish you all the best. Bye.